It's 1800, and Rome is in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars, that period of time that Napoleon was in power in France. There was a lot of fighting and lots of people taking political sides, not unlike now. But on our particular day in June, we're less concerned with political power and way more focused on the ultimately tragic love triangle between three of Rome's ridiculously dramatic citizens, today on Scores Unstitched. Now, I don't know about you guys, but my inclination is to always assume that operas take place at the same time the composer was living, because like, I guess it's all old. But actually, the setting of Tosca was a hundred years before its first performance. Actually, exactly a hundred years. It was premiered in 1900, but set in 1800. So the first audience that went to see Tosca was expected to be at least a little bit familiar with the Napoleonic Wars. And that's still true for us today. Now, I know you're all super familiar with Napoleon's March on Rome in 1797, and like it's totally common knowledge, and I barely have to say anything about it, but we're just gonna do a two minute brush up, just, just in case. Napoleon started invading Italy in 1797, three years before our fateful summer day in Tosca. Unfortunately for him, Austria was already all up in Italy and they were way stronger than Napoleon, so he lost a lot multiple times. You can't say the dude didn't try. So that's happening. Meanwhile, there's this queen hanging out in Rome. She was the queen of the Regno delle Due Sicilie, the Queen of Naples. Her name was Maria Carolina, and she was married to the, by all accounts, completely spineless Ferdinand IV, the King of Naples and Sicily. You might actually know her better as Marie Antoinette's sister. Marie and Maria. That wasn't confusing at home. And incidentally, Maria's husband Ferdinand was Marie Antoinette's husband Louis XVI's cousin. And as you may or may not recall, Louis and Marie had just met their pretty gruesome deaths in 1793, so Ferdinand and Maria weren't exactly fans of French republicanism, and by extension, Napoleon. Fast forward to September of 1799, and Rome was up for grabs. So Maria dragged her useless husband from Sicily up to Rome, and they took up residence at their palazzo, and she declared Rome to be hers. And now with Rome in her iron fist, Maria goes on this republican rampage at the hands of her civil commander. Under the pretext of establishing order, he filled the prisons with honorable citizens. Soldiers of the Neapolitan army pillaged the homes of all partisans of the Republic. They shot and killed all who resisted. And nine months later, this is the Rome of Tosca. So Tosca is a political, romantic drama, and the whole opera takes place within less than 24 hours on June 17, 1800 in Rome. The plot revolves around three main characters. First, you've got Floria Tosca, who the opera is, of course, named after, and she's the most beautiful and popular opera diva in Rome, kind of like a modern-day Beyoncé equivalent. Second, you've got her boyfriend, Mario Cavararossi, who is a painter and a Napoleon supporter. Ugh. And then you've got the guy who's not so secretly pining after Tosca and just generally being super creepy, Scarpia. He's the chief of police, and one of those dudes we talked about before who was responsible for filling the prisons with honorable citizens, if he suspected any kind of allegiance to Napoleon. Well, conveniently for him, Cavararossi, Tosca's boyfriend, and the reason she's not single for him, accidentally gives him a clue that he's a Napoleon dude. So Scarpia decides to manipulate Tosca into telling him where he can find her boyfriend. Super smart. I, I literally can't tell you how many times I have fallen in love with men after they imprisoned my boyfriend. But Tosca takes the bait, not the brightest, bless her heart, and Scarpia arrests Cavararossi. Shockingly though, this doesn't make Tosca love him. So he goes for second best and tells her that if she sleeps with him, he'll let her boyfriend go. So probably not actually love he's looking for, turns out. And here is where we'll stop and I'll let the performers take over when you go to see the show. Or like, you know, Google it if you want the spoiler. So now that we know the basic plot and the context, let's look at all the other stuff to know when you go to see Tosca. Tosca, the opera, was composed by Puccini, with a libretto written by the pair who'd also worked with him on Madame Butterfly and La Boheme. Ilica and Giacosa talk about a bonkers trifecta. But it was by no means an easy process, and ultimately it took 11 years to create from start to finish. And that's because before Tosca was an opera, it was a play, written by a guy named Victorien Sardou. 
Puccini went to see the play three times in the year it premiered, and then finally wrote to Sardou saying, I see in this Tosca the opera I need. Now at first Sardou was like totally into the idea, but after a few years of Puccini making literally no progress on the project, Sardou got tired of waiting, and instead sold the rights to Puccini's contemporary rival, Alberto Franchetti. It was a smart move, and Puccini fought to earn the rights back, ultimately getting them again in 1895. Then the four years that followed were pretty standard for Puccini, with loads of fighting between himself and his librettists and his publisher, with all of them constantly threatening to quit. Artists. But the opera finally made its battered way to the stage, where it was completely picked apart by critics, but actually adored by the audiences, and it is still the fifth most performed opera in the world today. Now, Tosca itself is three acts long with two intermissions. The first act is the longest at about 45 minutes, the second and the third are each about half an hour, maybe a little less. So, when you go to see this show, you'll probably have two short intermissions to go get a drink, have a smoke, hopefully not leave. Like a lot of operas from this time period, what musicologists call the Romantic era, the opera is through composed, which is a fancy way of saying it sounds like one whole piece of music. That's in contrast to operas from the classical or Baroque period, so think Mozart or Handel, that have a lot of recitative in them. Puccini also took a page out of Wagner's book and wrote a slew of leitmotifs into Tosca, which is when composers assign a musical theme to a certain character or an idea in the plot. You can think of our modern day king of this, who's John Williams, most notably in the soundtrack in Star Wars. There are certain themes in Star Wars that immediately make you think of something because of how they're used. It's an amazing plot device that can do things like foreshadow, manipulate your emotions, or give you clues to a character's deeper intentions just by the music that's playing underneath. And the same is true in Tosca, though admittedly Puccini only gets three acts to show you as opposed to, I don't know, what are we on now, 12 Star Wars movies? Actually, you know what, let's just, let's just listen to them. The Tosca motifs, I mean, not Star Wars, because... Now, there are actually quite a lot, but for your first time hearing Tosca, there are four big ones to pay attention to. First, the Scarpia chords. And then second, the prisoner who escapes from the prison. And then third is Tosca's theme. And then fourth and last is the love theme between Tosca and Mario. And besides those musical elements, there are also a few arias to be on the lookout for. Sort of the sung monologues that can stop the action for a second so a character can wax poetic about their emotions or art or whatever and pretend it has everything to do with deepening your connection to their point of view and absolutely nothing to do with showing off the own vocal range of the performer or their technical prowess. And I say to be on the lookout for them because the opera's not going to stop and have the singer announce, I am now doing the aria Kate told you about. They could be probably like three quarters of the way through it before you even realize they started. So, pro tip, the title of the aria is always the first words the singer sings. Now, it's not always so convenient, but it just so happens that the three big well-known arias from Tosca are nicely divided across the three acts. So first up is what we'll call the warm-up aria, I guess. About five minutes into act one, Cavallarossi sings an aria called Recondita Armonia, or concealed harmony, like artistic harmony between beauty and color and other painterly things. But yeah, not definitely not musical harmony, which it's 
probably easy to think in this video. What makes this aria a challenge isn't so much the piece itself, but just that it happens so darn quick out of the gate. It doesn't give the singer much of a chance to get warm. And the piece has a high B flat. The judgy note for tenors, like for sopranos, is the high C. This is only a whole step below, so it's, it's freaking high. By the way, if you want to hear any of these arias before you head to the theater, I've dropped some links to my favorite recordings below. Next up, we have Tosca herself. And funnily enough, this aria was actually almost scrapped entirely by Puccini because he thought it stopped the action too much. And you know, I don't think he was wrong, but Boy howdy, this would have left quite a void in the soprano repertoire if he'd scrapped it because everyone and their mother excerpts this aria for concerts. Tosca sings this one as Scarpia is actually in the middle of coming on to her and she's trying to decide if she's going to give in to him or not, so the action stops. So if for some horrific reason you're bored during this aria, go ahead and entertain yourself by watching the poor dude playing Scarpia, trying to find things to do while she's singing that still look natural because he's literally been paused mid-seduction. It can get super awkward. And finally, our last beautiful aria really speaks for itself. This one is another tenor aria sung by Cavallarossi called E luce van le stelle, and also happens pretty much right at the top of Act 3. And I won't go into too much detail for fear of spoilers, except to say that Cavallarossi is incredibly sad while he's writing a letter. And we're gonna leave it at that. The recording I picked for this one, by the way, is Pavarotti because A, duh, and B, the applause at the end is literally longer than the aria was. Seriously, go watch. And there you have it, a romantic drama unraveling in the political passions of Rome set to some of Puccini's most toe-wiggle-inducing orchestration and five-minute applause cycles. Let me know if you've seen Tosca before, or if this is going to be your first time, or maybe even your first trip to the Opera House. I'm super curious. And I'll see you next time on Scores Unstitched.